Today, we're speaking with Anthony Redgrave. Anthony, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? My name, as you just said, is Anthony Redgrave. I am a former team lead for the DNA Doe Project and current co-founder and lead forensic genealogist of Redgrave Research Forensic Services. Um, I have a background in instructional design and also in forensic genealogy. So my, my entire MO is just teaching other people how to do the thing that I do because there's not enough of us and there's unfortunately more than enough cold cases to go around. Um, I led the team for the Clark County John Doe case who was then identified as Joseph Henry Loveless who was found uh, dismembered body parts in a cave twice, 1979 and again in 1991. Um, and I have uh, worked on a number of cases other than that one. And, um, but the, the most interesting thing about the Loveless case is that there were a number of hands on it before it came to us and uh, we closed it out. That's amazing. That's incredible. I understand it was the oldest open doe case that was closed out using forensic genetic gene genealogy? Yeah, currently, uh, to my knowledge, it is the current, is currently the oldest open uh, unidentified decedent case with law enforcement that was closed with forensic genetic genealogy um, and not just with um, Y or, or mitochondrial haplogroups or STRs. And, um, you know, it, it was someone who died in probably 1916, but they didn't know that when they found the remains. They thought that he might have died significantly more recently because they were so well preserved. So it stayed an open cold case. And unless there's something I haven't heard about yet, and I check the news frequently, this is still the oldest open, uh, the, the oldest case that was closed with forensic genealogy. That's, that's really remarkable. Tell us a little bit more about it. What was the secret to solving it? Yeah, um, so the, the biggest thing was just teamwork. Um, we had a very strong team working on this case together. Um, and we all had a lot of experience working on other very difficult cases. And just being open to uh, being flexible on what had come before us, knowing that the uh, post-mortem interval estimate could have been wildly off. We were, we were aware of that. We knew that even the, the height and age estimate could be off because the biggest identifier of, of age and height are the, the long bones which were cut and the cranium which was never found. So we had almost no information other than the clothes he was found with and where he was found. So using that and being open to any number of variables, we just worked diligently. And um, the biggest thing for us was just innovating along the way. We used a tool on uh, dnapainter.com called What Are the Odds, which is a conditional probability tool that combines the likelihood of a, of a, um, a person's relationship to their genetic matches based on the, the combined probabilities. And it kept telling us that he was really old and we'd never seen that happen before. We thought we broke it, <laughs> but we kept open to it. And we were like, no, it looks like he's really old. And keeping that in mind and also having uh, one of our volunteers, several of our volunteers actually working very hard with, um, with the, the Y DNA and figuring out the surname, um, those things together, the Y DNA, the, the X segments that led us to the maternal line, all that combined together is what eventually led to it. And a lot of research in archival newspapers um, because he was using an alias. He was born Joseph Henry Loveless. He was wanted under the name Walter Cairns. Walter Cairns went missing from having escaped from jail wearing the clothes that Joseph Henry Loveless was found wearing in the cave when he was dismembered and left there. <laughs> wow. that's. It gets so complicated. It's, it's yeah. so, so interesting. How do you approach, when you have a case like this with forensic genealogy, how do you approach it? Where do you start? Well, we do a couple of things first. The, the first thing that we do is when we, when we get the file from the lab and it's uploaded to GEDmatch, the first thing we do is we check a couple of things for analytics. We look at the admixture, which is the 
combination of ethnicity estimates of that person, like where their ancestors were from. We use a tool called Are Your Parents Related, which shows um, runs of homozygosity, which is places where a person's DNA is the same on either side of the chromosome. And um, that's very important to us because that affects what we're looking at in terms of, um, it, it affects the, the estimates of the relationships to the other, the other matches because they might share higher than they actually are if that's the case. And usually the answer is no, but it's always good to check instead of find out later because you didn't check. Um, and we also do things like cluster reports to group the matches together so we can figure out who the common ancestors are. And then after all that's done, then we start looking at the individual matches and figuring out where they match each other, finding their common ancestors and working down from there. And it turns into this weird sort of Sudoku puzzle of like a web of, of logic problem. And it can take anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of months to come to a conclusion. Wow, that's remarkable. I've heard puzzle used before and it does seem like that. Like oh, it's, it's a puzzle. It's a puzzle made out of people. <laughs> right, exactly. And it's relatively new to the field if we're looking at the entire history of you know, forensic science. Wow. Where do you think it stands now? Where is it going? I know that's asking you to you know, make a guess, which is probably the last thing you want to do. But I'd just be curious, what do you see happening in the near future? Um, well, what I see happening in the near future is that more, uh, more law enforcement agencies will be open to using this technology. More agencies will be able to get their own whole genome sequencing equipment and be able to do more things in-house at their own crime labs. Um, and they'll be more open to accepting help from uh, forensic genealogists valuing our work and hopefully closing out a lot of cases that, need, that, that are in dire need of attention. Um, one interesting thing that I, I believe about forensic genealogy is that it can only get easier to solve a case rather than harder as long as you capture that whole genome sequence while, while, the, while the data is good. Um, because more and more people are testing and opting into law enforcement matching. Um, more and more people are being born and descending from these people's ancestors and you just have more data to work with instead of less. So True. That's, uh, that's a huge deal. Yeah. Um, and it's really giving a lot of people a lot of hope. Um, people who have lost family members and um, the perpetrator case has gone cold. If there's a DNA sample, we can help with that. Um, people who are missing loved ones who are assumed deceased, but they don't know um, where they are. Um, one of our one of the people on our team, Dr. Michael, Dr. Amy Michael, who was the one who brought the Loveless case to DNA Doe Project, has a saying of hope dies last, and we hold very strong to that. Um, because this is, this is the thing that I think is, it shouldn't have to, it, it shouldn't have to be, um, it shouldn't have to be hard to convince people that this is working. And it's getting easier to convince people that it's working because it's definitely, once you've tried everything else, this is the thing that works most of the time. That and eventually, is, eventually, maybe it'll be all the time if we just get better. That is so beautifully said. Um, I, I think you're really, yeah, capturing what's at the heart of it is hope and helping other people. That's remarkable. I like, I like that a lot. Um, <laughs> let's talk about what you're working on now, if you can. Yeah, um, so I have uh, formed my own company with my, my wife and genealogy partner, Redgrave Research Forensic Services. And we are able to take um, a number of cases that others uh, may have had a struggle with solving. Um, one thing that we're taking away from our experience with the DNA Doe Project is being able to be in the midst of that think tank and learn how to do really hard things like working with people who are from endogamous populations where there's a lot of intermarriage between cousins or really old cases or cases of people who are minorities. And we can take that experience and apply it to things that the DNA Doe Project is not equipped to take like child cases and perpetrators, which is not within their scope. So, and we can also train agencies on how to do this themselves as well expanding the field of who can do this work effectively. Um, we're also uh, 
uh, we're also doing a very important project that's very near and dear to my heart called uh, we're, we have a, a task force, we have the Transdo task force, where we look for cases of unidentified decedents who might have been transgender or gender variant or intersex, or there's just not enough um, anthropological markers to determine a, a sex estimate, and taking on those cases from a very compassionate and understanding standpoint of this person's lived identity might be different from their biological markers so that we can handle that with care. And in addition to that, we are in the process of building a comparison database for this purpose where people who are um, not only just family members, but chosen family of people in the LGBTQ spectrum who are missing someone who's gone missing, like it's their roommate or a friend they used to see at the club or something, people who can't usually file a police report can give us that information. We'll, we'll keep it safe and, and private as well to reduce harm and be able to compare that person's identifiers to the unidentified decedents that we find who may have fallen under the Transdo Task Force umbrella. We're, we're calling it the LGBTQ Accountability for Missing and Murdered Persons Project, or LAMP for short. And that's currently in development. So if an agency comes across an unidentified person who might have been assigned male but found wearing female clothing, or there's um, some indication of uh, their appearance not matching what their DNA says when they run STRs. We can, we can take that into account. They can submit that to us as well. And hopefully we can close out more cases without even having to come to the point of having to do genealogy if we just have a place where people can just connect. That is very important. How would people reach out to you if they have something like that right now? Um, if someone has a, if someone has a case of an identifi unidentified person who who might have fallen under our, that umbrella, they can go to our website at transdotaskforce.org, where we have a form they can submit to, or you can just email us directly at transdotaskforce at gmail.com. Um, and likewise, if somebody has um, a loved one or a friend or a family member who's missing and they want to get that information to us, they can come through the same avenue and get that to us as well. And we'll, we'll keep that on hand. And once the database is up and running, we'll get it all entered in and we can start doing the comparisons now manually. Wow, that's amazing. So it's, it's so, um, I always love to hear backstory if you're willing to share it. How did you, when did you start Red, Red Grave Research? How did you and your wife get interested in this field even to start? Yeah. Yeah, um, uh, technically we started uh, Red Grave Research as a project in 2015 when we were doing our own local history research and working with adoptees and NPEs, non-paternity events or not the parent expected, and helping people who are living people out with their questions. And um, we expanded and focused more on, on forensic work once we learned about the DNA Doe project and had enough experience with that, we started fleshing out the concept and, and narrowing that focus. And it's like all the things that we've experienced in our lives have made it so that this is what we're for. <laughs> and um, so, and, and we've also made some good friends along the way. We have Dr. Amy Michael, who's our anthropology consultant. Um, and she, we, we've got an excellent partnership with a number of anthropologists actually. Um, I've also learned how to do forensic art along the way, and we've cool. added that to our repertoire as well. What and, is that? Hmm? Forensic art. Tell, tell me more about yeah, that. Um, well, if somebody has an unidentified decedent who has uh, skeletal remains, I can uh, create a reconstruction image off of those remains of, of what they may have looked like in life. And I can also do that for, um, I can also do that for perpetrator sketches if necessary, or age progressions. In the case of Henry Lovelace, the image that, that gets attached to his, his uh, articles that goes all around, I made that based on pictures of his immediate family members and the description on the wanted poster. Um, so that was another skill that I managed to acquire. <laughs> um, and also, we also have the Forensic Genealogy Training for Law Enforcement Program. It's at fg4le.com. And that's under the Red Grave Research umbrella too, where we can train law enforcement professionals and people from the community who are already experienced in doing genealogy or are just interested in anthropology students. I love anthropologists, they're my favorite. <laughs> and um, we 
have a we have a program there where people can take an a self-paced online training course to learn the basics and from there there's also an internship program where when we have a case that we're working on they can come on board with us and train on on active cases to get experience under their own belts so they can move on to help other agencies as well oh, that's wonderful bringing new people into the fold and yes yeah, it's, it's so necessary yeah there's well, um, and we certainly appreciate you presenting at ishi too so i know you presented on the loveless case did you get a chance to attend any of the sessions i actually haven't yet <laughs> um i i found a little busy um, i can understand yeah <laughs> definitely all, always busy um I am incredibly grateful for Ishi actually being virtual this year because then I can uh, watch the archives and that makes me very happy because I, while I'm always busy, I'm always also flexible. I never know when I'm going to have a chunk of time to do that. So I'm going to be going back and watching the archives over the next week or so. I'm really excited about the uh, forensic gen genetic genealogy workshop that was put on. I'll be very happy to watch the replay of that. and. Um, just what everybody else is doing in the field and how that can make what we're doing stronger too. It's yes. so collaborative. Um, everything just comes together at this point. There's a real, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real collaborative effort when it comes to forensic genealogy because we're working with law enforcement, we're working with anthropologists, DNA scientists, genealogists, historical researchers, everything just comes together at this point and it's so important for everyone to work together and meet up here and bring what they have to the table. It's such a wonderful group and it's been so rewarding to hear that people um, are having a good experience with the virtual event being the first one and only one that we've done mm -hmm. in 31 years now so <laughs> <laughs> anything else about your work or the loveless case that we might have missed that you'd like to add well the um the a couple interesting things about the loveless case that i didn't mention earlier were that aside from the fact that he was uh old and died a very long time ago, there were other difficulties in, in identifying him because I mentioned earlier endogamy, which is the, the practice of intermarriage within a small community. Um, he descended from uh, descendants of the original Mormon pioneers who traveled you know, in the handcart companies. His ancestors came from Massachusetts to Utah and then Idaho. Um, so that also involves um, a short period of time where there was a, a practice of plural marriage where a uh, man would have multiple spouses and that only lasted for a very short period of time, but it definitely affects the way that the DNA looks for people who descend from those families because it's not only potential endogamy, but also a lot of half relationships. And both of those things are complicating factors when you're working in genetic genealogy. So we had both of those things to deal with and the aliases and the fact that he was also a wanted criminal and therefore didn't have a very good legal paper trail. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, it, it was, uh, there were a lot of factors on that and, um, and plus the, the lack of being able to be really uh, firm in any sort of anthropological estimate because of the state of the remains and how they were preserved. Like there was, there, there was probably no other way that that case would have gotten solved, even though the best people in every field had had their hands on it and tried multiple times. This is clearly the way that it was going to be done. And I think that it's an exemplar of the power of this method. When what did it feel like when you finally realized, you know, we've got it? I was... I was floored. Like, I think I was in a daze for a couple of days afterwards. Once, like, it actually took me a while to grasp what was happening when we started putting the pieces together of, okay, so this man under this name is wanted for killing his wife. This, this woman had a supposed previous husband under this name. The DNA is pointing to Henry Lovelace, the supposed previous husband, but the physical description of the clothing matches the man who's wanted for her murder. Oh, wait, they're the same person. <laughs> I had a bunch of tabs open on my computer with all of these articles um, about all these supposedly different people who we were starting to see were the same person. And I had them open on my desktop for a couple of days and it was like this crazy red string moment of like, what does it all mean? <laughs> and when it finally clicked, it was and we started like building a timeline of like 
we can account for this person under this name here and this one under this name here, but we can't make them overlap. It was amazing. It was just a really fun puzzle. Like it's a horrible thing that happened, but it's, it's fun for us and it has to be fun because we're dealing with difficult stuff all the time. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I love hearing the stories. It is remarkable how it all comes together one piece at a time and then, yeah, then it's right yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Anthony, thank you so much. We really appreciate you taking time. We know you're so busy. It's very gracious of you. This has been wonderful. Thanks for sharing more about the case and your work. Yeah, no problem. I, I will never get tired of talking about this case. <laughs> it's uh absolutely one of the most interesting and definitely the weirdest case I've ever worked on and absolutely the most satisfying to close out. Well, maybe second most satisfying, but we'll get there soon, I hope. <laughs> okay, well, then we'll need to talk again for certain. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great day. Thanks, you too.